Can we read people's minds from brain images? Take the amygdala, for example. There's a popular perception that the amygdala is responsive to fear and anxiety, and it is. But if we were to measure someone's brain activation when they saw political labels like Democrat or Republican and their amygdala was activated, could we then conclude that the person was anxious? Maybe. But if that's all the information we have, we can't say for sure. It turns out that the amygdala is responsive to a wide variety of stimuli, including faces, disgust, novelty, and even positive emotions. By assuming that one of these caused the amygdala to light up, we are using a technique called reverse inference. That is, we see a result or an end state, and we infer the cause from the data. For example, a coroner performs an autopsy and makes an educated guess about the cause of death. Or, to take a more everyday scenario, you wake up to find that the ground outside is wet, and you conclude that it must have rained last night. In both cases, you start at the end and go back in time to the beginning, hence the name reverse inference. However, there could be several possible causes, and you need to be careful about which conclusion you draw. Our biases can lead us to the cause we prefer, when in fact, it may be another cause, or a mixture of causes. In neuroimaging, for example, many regions of the brain show significant bold activity to more than one condition, as we saw in the case of the amygdala. This doesn't necessarily mean that reverse inference is never valid. It just means you need to think carefully when evaluating someone else's claims or when you interpret your own results. Here are a few things you can do to prevent or mitigate any reverse inference fallacies. 1. Have some perspective about the activation base rate of the region in question. If you find a significant effect in the anterior cingulate, for example, type that term into a meta-analysis package like Neurosynth. Then click the Studies button you will see a list of all the studies that were used to create this meta-analysis map. Note that within the first 10 studies that are displayed out of over 2,000, we see a range of different things that can activate this region, such as alertness, decision-making, faces, and errors. Others that could be listed include salience, novelty, conflict, and time perception. The more studies that find different conditions activate a region, the less likely that region is selective for one condition and nothing else. Second, it follows that if you are making a strong claim about what an effect represents, you will need a study design that has ruled out any plausible alternatives. Otherwise, a post hoc inference will probably be biased by whatever narrative you find most persuasive. A fallacy that is common across all fields of science and in our everyday lives. Lastly, gather any other data to constrain your inference. For example, if someone is making a claim that their effect in the cingulate cortex represents pain, see whether there are additional behavioral measures to support that conclusion. A relatively high galvanic skin response, for instance, would make it more likely that they are indeed finding a neural signature of pain rather than something like time perception. So there you have it, an introduction to reverse inference. There are a couple of really good papers on this topic by Russ Poldrack, which I used to make this video, and you can find them in the more info box down below. This is a common phenomenon that occurs not just in neuroimaging, like I said, but also in everyday life. So see if you can spot maybe in the next couple weeks, whether somebody else or maybe yourself might be making a faulty reverse inference. It's fun. And I'm gonna leave you with this question. Some people think that brain images should be admissible in court as a type of lie detector. Think of it as a more technologically advanced polygraph. We're looking at brain patterns and seeing if that can determine if somebody's lying or telling the truth. Uh, do you agree? Do you think that this is a valid piece of evidence especially if the technology becomes more refined and higher resolution, more accurate, 
or do you think that in any case it's overreaching? Let me know what you think in the comments down below.